that has had intersections, if you'll forgive the weirdness of that metaphor. <laughs> but uh, just as a side note, the biggest compliment I've gotten this week is someone to ask me how my Vietnamese was. So I had to say, ooh, I'm not Vietnamese, but thank you for asking. <coughs> but tonight, uh, we're here to welcome Trung Nguyen uh, to Washington, D.C. and give applause for that. Uh, as we uh, welcome him to talk about his uh, new graphic novel, there really isn't a better moment for this. Uh, it's uh, obviously, it's Vietnam week, and so we've uh, seen an amazing slate of programming that Vietnam Society has put on. I was telling Aaron that I really haven't seen as many and as, as many Vietnamese folks <laughs> and as much programming here in the district. So uh, we're obviously glad to be celebrating Vietnam Week, but it's also Banned Books Week nationally. Uh, and so I know that they're gonna talk about that, but it's also um, LGBTQ History Month. So there's an additional kind of wrinkle that we're here to celebrate and acknowledge tonight. Um, it's also Filipino American History Month, but that's another one example of those neat intersections I was talking about. Um, but uh, joining Trung on stage, for tonight's event is someone that I'm glad to say has been part of my orbit for the past year, thanks to Vietnam Society. Uh, ambassador Ted Osius was a uh, former ambassador to Vietnam from the US and has been a friend of the Vietnam Society, a friend of the Vietnamese community, and um, a lovely person to have in and around the city. So, uh, but, before they, uh, but before we go to them, it is my final honor to bring one more person up to stage and to introduce you to her, and that is Erin Steinauer. I'm grateful that she invited me and invited our office to be part of the Vietnam Society squad, and um, I'm looking forward to a lot more collaborations. So happy Vietnam week, and uh, I'm proud to welcome Erin Steinauer to the stage. Hi everyone, welcome. So wonderful to see you all tonight on a Wednesday night um, in the evening. It's really great that you came out. Of course, these two do not need introductions, but I'm here to introduce them. Um, Vietnam Society is a, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting and elevating the exquisite Vietnamese art and culture around the world. And I'm going to now introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, first, Ambassador Ted Osius. Uh, of course, Ben has already said a few things about him, but uh, let me just expand upon, about, upon that a bit. Uh, he is, the, uh, of course, the former ambassador uh, to Vietnam from 2014 to 2017. Um, he is currently the president and CEO of the US ASEAN Business Council. Founded in 1984, the council represents 175 of the largest American businesses in Southeast Asia. In October 2021, Ambassador Osius published his most recent book called Nothing is Impossible, America's Reconciliation with Vietnam, covering the two countries' 25-year journey from adversaries to friends. He was the first U.S. ambassador to receive the Order of Friendship from the President of Vietnam. He serves on the Asia Foundation Board of Trustees, the Board of Directors of Vietnam Society, and is a member of the American Academy of Diplomacy. Ambassador Osius speaks Vietnamese, French, Italian, and a bit of Japanese, Indonesian, Hindi, Thai, Thai uh, Tagalog, and Greek. He and his husband, Clayton Vaughn, has, uh, have a son and a daughter. Chung Le Nguyen is an award-winning Vietnamese-American cartoonist, artist, and writer from Minnesota. Chung's first original graphic novel, The Magic Fish, was published in 2020 by Random House Graphic, an imprint of Penguin, Books, Penguin Random House follows a young Vietnamese gay immigrant and his parents who bond and learn English through fairy tale books, it was inspired by Wing's upbringing. He has been nominated for an Eisner, a prize at Anguillem, France, a CLAD award, and he has won two Harvey Awards and Romics Awards in Italy. 
Chung has also contributed his work for DC Comics, Oni Press, Boom Studios, Image Comics, and Marvel. He was born in, um, born in a Vietnamese refugee camp in the Philippines and moved to the United States as a child in 1992. Let me welcome the two and let the show begin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron and Peter, and thank you, Ben. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, I was actually reflecting as we heard about your biography. Um, so Trung was born in, on the island of Palawan in the Philippines, and I visited when he was there. So I was a diplomat at the time, so he was probably one of those little kids running around uh, very <laughs> fast when this, uh, at that point, younger diplomat uh, uh, went to the Philippines to see uh, to see the refugee camp. But I am so excited to talk with Trung about this book because I, <laughs> I love this book. Uh, I, I, I never take the time to review books on Amazon, but this one I had to because I really want, I want more and more people to, to, to s read and see this beautiful book. I'm not even a, a huge fan of graphic novels, but this one has converted me. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's so gorgeous, but let me just read uh, a short part of, of my review so you can get a sense of why I love it so much, and then I'm going to start asking Trung questions. And, and after a little while, I'll turn to you and see what questions that you have uh, for our author. So I think Magic is the right title for the book. It's, it's just glorious, uh, glorious and magical. The luxurious colored graphics illuminate uh, interwoven stories. There's the past, and that's the story of Hien and Vin falling in love and fleeing from Vietnam on a boat. It's in brown and tan hues. Then there are th these fables, these three gorgeous fables in blue, mostly in blue and purple. And then, uh, and there are, there are peach and blood that sort of emerge from Peach, peach and blood red that emerge uh, during, in particular during the, the fables. But then there's the central story, which is set in 1998. And the reason you know it's 1998 is because Tian, the protagonist, hears on the radio about Matthew Shepard uh, and hears you know, here he is 13 years old coming to grips with who he is and he hears the story about this kid being tied to a fence. That part, the central story, is in soft red and pink and it's the story of a boy and his mother figuring out how to express love without the benefit of an appropriate vernacular. And this is a really important theme in the book is language and how people within a family talk to one another. And I, I have to guess that this is part of the immigrant, ex immigrant experience for many, where the kids who are growing up truly, truly American uh, have to struggle a little bit to speak with their parents or their grandparents uh, who come from really a different culture and in many cases speak a different language. And that was certainly uh, when I, when I uh, mentored uh, uh, Vietnamese American boy, Nguyen Mi Gop Viet, which I prefer, I prefer to Vietnamese American. Uh, I remember him, he would always have to switch and speak to his parents in Vietnamese and he would help me, my Vietnamese is okay, but he would help me when I didn't, didn't understand. And that's the position that a lot of uh, recent immigrants face. And so within the family, there are these challenges. If you're talking to your grandmother, it's gonna be in Vietnamese. If you're talking to your parents, it's probably going to be at Vietnamese. And in the case of Tian, he's helping his parents, especially his mother, uh, understand English. And he's using the vehicle of these gorgeous fairy tales. So that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about it through questions, and then I'm going to uh, turn to you. But let's start with what we just heard earlier, which is that this is banned book week. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that, when I think about that, <laughs> that really, uh, the fact that we have to have a banned book week in the United States uh, is, is not a, a happy signal. 
about where we are, but this book is banned in Texas and in Florida, I understand, and maybe other other places as well. But can you yeah. tell us why? Why is this book banned? Um, you know, I... Well, first of all, thank you so much for all of your kind words earlier. I uh, uh, And thank you to the audience watching me kind of like turn redder and redder <laughs> as this <laughs> continued. I was like, oh, this is really happening. <laughs> So thank you very much. That's very gracious of you. Um, on the topic of banned books, whenever my book comes up, it oftentimes is accompanied with a little note saying that there is uh, age-inappropriate content for middle schoolers, um, which I think is not atypical because the book was purchased as a young adult graphic novel, and so it's intended for a slightly older audience thematically, but I wrote the book in such a way that I wanted it to be very accessible to a much broader audience. Um, and I, I found it really fascinating to kind of dig through the euphemisms that people would use for discussing queer issues. And occasionally people took umbrage to it being an immigrant story as well, which really broke my heart. Um, for a, a time, I complained that the, none, of the, none of the notes uh, ever mentioned any of the, the graphic material. Like, they, they never mentioned the cannibalism when they mentioned the magic fish and trying to ban it, but they really went in on the queer themes. And so I thought that was really fascinating and then they immediately rectified that afterwards because then when I mentioned that on the internet, people started to include that in the notes and I was like, thank you for paying attention to me, I guess. <laughs> but um, for it, it, when it comes to banned books, it's really um, tempting to think of the individual authors who will be impacted. And I think that's a lovely uh, first uh, inclination, but for me personally, I find that the broader movement to ban books is more about trying to get the public to mistrust public institutions that are there for the public good. They're trying to get people to be distrustful of the public library, which if you've read The Magic Fish or if you're about to, plays a really important role in the development of the characters and their relationships. And so in terms of banned books, it's not something that I love to talk about because there's only so much that you can really say about banned books, but I, I tend to implore people to get involved in your local school districts and get involved in supporting your local libraries because those really are the vanguards to free speech and to making sure that readers have access to stories that are really important to them. I love that. Thank you. So uh, my kids are eight and nine. They love graphic novels, and they've actually been the ones teaching me about graphic novels. I, w I was thinking I'd read this book with them, uh, because I like it so much, and I know they will. And I wasn't at all worried about the kind of the coming out story, but maybe I should be. <laughs> uh, but but I, I, there is cannibalism. I mean, there are parts of the, the fairy tales that are gruesome. There's a, uh, there's a a time when a, a girl gets boiled in, in sunflower oil or saffron oil, sesame oil. And so, I mean, there's some gruesome parts. Now, the, when you look at Hans Christian Andersen and The Little Mermaid, there are some gruesome, and the, and the Brothers Grimm stories, there are gruesome things in fairy tales. This is just the, the way it is. Uh, the first fairy tale, I would have to say, is not gruesome at all, it's just it's just gorgeous, and uh, you know ha it actually has a happy ending. And the third one, just you wait. You're kind of thinking there's going to be a sad ending to the third one, and there's a twist at the end. And I'm not going to give this one away uh, because it's it's too beautiful. And but <laughs> it shocked me so much I had to weep a little bit because uh, it's it's really a, a beautiful twist. But it's worth going through all of them before, don't jump ahead to that last page, <laughs> those last pages, because you want to read all of it before you get uh, to that, that beautiful ending. But I want to go to the, the immigrant experience discussion. Um, your note, the author's note, describes characters living within social margins. And, and what you said in your note is immigrant stories include the gravity of marginalization. Things continue to happen even after the exodus, even after uh, Hien and Vin leave Vietnam, their story continues. They have children, things happen. Um, and you write about in the indignities of feeling lost in your own tongue and how to decenter the gravity 
of marginalization. Help us understand what you're conveying there. Sure. Um, so in making the magic fish, I and this happens with a lot of um, a lot of creators who work um, kind of from the margins or who have experienced, you know, like an immigrant background, um, where there is this tension between the life that you know and the culture that you've sort of absorbed piecemeal from your parents, but you're living in a space where that culture is not prevalent, and so you feel like a fraud, and you wonder if your experience itself can be regarded as something that's authentic. And it was something that I had to really struggle with when I was writing The Magic Fish because I had grown up largely, you know, I grew up in Minnesota. There's not a huge Vietnamese American community there. And so I felt like I was on the outside looking in of my family's culture and very kind of set apart in that way. And I had to really come to grips with the notion that wherever it is that I plant my feet, that is exactly where I should feel comfortable at home. And it really took the creation of this book and the conversations that I had with my parents in order to make it for me to feel like I could really tell this story because it's authentically mine. Um, I think it's one of those things that, um, you know, writers of color or queer authors tend to go through where we feel this special responsibility to edify the public about our experiences. But that's not a responsibility that, uh, that authors who kind of exist in hegemonic spaces have to deal with, you know, like Judy Bloom doesn't have to educate people about whiteness. <laughs> Judy Bloom gets to tell beautiful stories yeah. that really speak to the reader on her level. And I want that for authors of color. And I decided that I don't have a, res a special responsibility to teach people about Vietnam. I get to tell the story that I have in me at that moment as, as wherever it was that I was on my journey. And so I, I sort of um, surrendered that responsibility and I uh, kind of moved away from the gravity of marginalization in order to make sure that I told something that was authentic to me. Yes. Thank you. Yes. But there is Vietnam mm -hmm. in this story. The uh, mother, Hien, goes to, she goes home uh, after her mother passes away. And there are these flashbacks to the earlier story. And there's a, a little boy, a 13-year-old boy, who has glasses that look <laughs> sort of like yours. Yeah. And so that makes me think that maybe Tian and you have some things in common. And so I look at this 13-year-old boy who's having the ex experiences of an American boy in his school, and he has these wonderful friends, uh, Claire and Julian, who are his, his dear, dear friends and who are very supportive of whom, of him, uh, whoever he might turn out to be. Um, a, a in fact, that makes me want to come to one of the, Julian, for example. Yeah. Tian, Tian has a kind of a crush on, on Julian, who's athletic and sweaty. <laughs> uh, and it, I was just wondering if, if is, is Julian, is Julian, d was there somebody in your life who was a little bit like Julian? Um, Julian is a little bit of a, a combination of a bunch of friends that I had growing up. I had the good fortune. I mean, I was parochially educated for my entire life. And so I really, in retrospect, find myself to be very lucky to have met people who were as kind and compassionate as the characters in the book. And I, I really wanted to make The Magic Fish uh, a story about, that didn't center queer trauma. There are a lot of, like I grew up reading a lot of uh, coming out stories that went in all kinds of different directions, but there's always a ton of fear and trepidation that's eventually realized by the characters. And I didn't want to push back on those stories at all. Those are necessary and those were important to my upbringing. Um, but I wanted to proffer an alternative. I wanted to make a queer story where the character is uh, is supported in every facet of who he is. And so that's kind of why I wanted to sort of um, add these pieces from my life that I found to be really precious to the magic fish. I wanted to um, proffer an alternative that you know it's reasonable to expect people to be kind to you. And, uh, and I will give something, a little bit of something away here. Sorry, uh, close your ears if you don't want to hear it. Um, at a certain point, uh, they're going to a school dance, and Julian is really his good friend. They've been friends since grade school. And Julian says, well, let's dance. And, uh, and uh, Tian asks, well, are, are you gay? He says, no, I don't think so. But he's there for his friend, and it's so beautiful. He's, he's there for his 13-year-old uh, his friend who's trying to 
figure out who he is. Uh, anyway, I, the characters are quite, they, they grab you, uh, especially the mother, uh, because the mother is trying to figure out how to communicate uh, across cultures in a way uh, with her son, also across cultures with the mother. Uh, and uh, it's a, she's in, she faces quite a dilemma, and she does her best, don't we all? Uh, throughout, throughout these, uh, especially the, the fairy tales, there is sea imagery. You know, the last fairy tale uh, has a passing resemblance to The Little Mermaid. And, but the first fairy tale also relies on the sea a lot. The, some of the, the characters who support her uh, come from the sea. Uh, I guess this, there's not so much sea in the middle story, but there, uh, there sure is in the, in the first and the third. And there's one line that comes back a couple of times, and it, and it echoes when you, when you read it. Uh, what is the point of tears among so much salt water? It's, I love that. I love that. that what, what does that mean to you? What is the point of tears among so much salt water? Well, um, I think that line was something that I had extracted from some iteration of The Little Mermaid, actually. And The Little Mermaid is a story that I love a lot because when I was in school, um, I became really fixated on Hans Christian Andersen. I loved his fairy tales, and I loved the way that he really made them super personal. And Hans Christian Andersen is one of those fascinating writers who is technically kind of a contemporary. He was an author who had an editor who was traditionally published. We don't think of fairy tales quite that way, but Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales have a specific author. It's not collected from people. It's not editorialized by, like the Brothers Grimm, their stories are, are collected and then editorialized for publication. Hans Christian Andersen wrote original stories largely. And The Little Mermaid is an allegory for his attraction to a male friend of his um, the story was published in 1837, and the years leading up to that, he was having sort of this contentious letter exchange between him and a friend of his by the name of Edvard Collins, who was an accountant. And he was deeply in love with Edvard, and Edvard ended up marrying a mutual friend of theirs, and Hans Christian Andersen was completely heartbroken. And he described the experience as feeling like, I feel as though I am half a woman when describing his attraction to his friend. And he would often insert himself into his books and he would write himself as animals because he felt very awkward. He was a man who moved through a lot of different social strata. And so he tended to be very comfortable writing about transitions and The Little Mermaid was super personal to that specific relationship. And so it was always kind of this queer allegory and it blew my mind when I found that out as a kid. Um, and as I got older and I started to sort of do a little bit more reflection, I found that The Little Mermaid specifically resonates with me as an immigrant because it's about a young woman who gives up her power, she gives up her voice, her language, everything that she knows in order to be with the people that she loves. And that's something that all of our parents had gone through already. So it was something that I found was resonant to me on multiple levels. And so the ocean as an allegory, it kind of, it, it's, it's quintessentially Vietnamese too, because there are so many ocean motifs. If you read any Vietnamese authors or artists, the ocean plays a huge role in the ways that we articulate our journeys because it plays such an enormous and outsized role in the ways that the, the trauma of separation and the traumas of war specifically kind of inform the ways that we navigate the world. And so the ocean as a space in between two shores was something that I really wanted to um, make sure that I nodded to in the book. And I tried really hard not to knock people over the head with it, but it, that's kind of the context for why the ocean plays such an important role in Magic Fish. Well, of course, the ocean divides us, divides he and from her, her mother in yeah. Vietnam. The ocean is how he and and Vin got away from Vietnam. But did you know, all know that about Hans Christian Andersen? I certainly didn't. Uh, I did, did not know, I mean, I love the story and I've seen even this recent Hollywood version uh, with my kids, uh, but I had no idea. Uh, so this, this backstory uh, I think is incredibly revealing. Now I expect there are other, because you know a, a lot about, uh, about the backstory. And Tattercoats has a backstory. It, it depends, and I'm going to totally mangle this. 
Allerlerau. Uh, I could speak Vietnamese much better than German. Yeah, uh, so the German story is called, and I don't know how to pronounce it totally correctly either, so my approximation of it, based on a YouTube clip that I heard, is Allerlerau is what it's called. There's like a German R in there that I have a lot of trouble pronouncing, but it's a, a variant of the Cinderella story. Well, that one's really beautiful. Uh, and the, the, v the, f the 1950s version of the Cinderella story that's in Vietnam is beautiful and gruesome. Uh, that's the one. <laughs> I wonder if I might have to skip a couple pages <laughs> with my with my kids. It's, but of course, cannibalism is not as bad as being queer. Uh, we we know this. <laughs> from, uh, so, but when the Vietnamese version, this 1950s version, uh, it you you use the kind of Hong Kong films as the style, and I and it's sort of 1950s Vietnam. Right? I mean, can you, how close to the original is it, and why did you choose uh, that period and that particular style? Because each, each one has its, diff its own different style. That is a fantastic question, and I'm so excited because I've never gotten an opportunity to explain this choice before. Um, we're also finding out in real time that I didn't, I'm a huge nerd and I know too many things about fairy tales. Um, <laughs> so the reason why I decided to set the Vietnamese Cinderella in the 1950s um, was because as I was doing my visual research for the magic fish, and I like to be really intentional with my iconography, I like to make sure that everything comes from a place. Um, I'm a strong believer in the notion that if you make a story for young readers, they deserve something beautiful, whether they know the context for it or not. They deserve to read something beautiful and something intentional. And so I went in and I put all of this effort into doing research and actually went to my public library to do a lot of the research. Because did you know that if you go to the public library and you're like, I need visual resources for this project that I'm working on, they can pull periodicals and ephemera and all kinds of materials that you don't find on the shelves all the time and they'll send you home with copies of it. Go to the, support your public library, they're fantastic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and so I, I realized, and a part of the imposter syndrome that I felt in telling an authentic Vietnamese American story was that I had no idea what ancient Vietnam looked like because I just had no sense of the history of Vietnam. I was born in the Philippines, I grew up in Minnesota, um, and so all of the stories that I'd heard about Vietnam were from the war, and all of the imagery that was swimming around in my head, they're all war-oriented, which was not super appropriate for this story. Um, and I realized that I, I, I don't have, even in my imagination, an inkling of what Vietnam looked like hundreds of years in the past. And I tried to do research on my own, and it just wasn't turning up anything that I could use in any sense of confidence. And I, I actually used the opportunity to get to know my grandmother a little bit better. So instead of setting the story in ancient Vietnam, I decided that I was going to set the story in a visual space that was familiar to someone that I loved. And so I got to have conversations with my grandmother about what she saw and the clothes that people wore and what buildings looked like when she was a little girl. Um, so I, I had an opportunity to talk to her about all these things and I took a bunch of notes and then I went to the library and repeated that process and so that's how I learned about you know, the, the colonialism that went on in Vietnam for a number of years, why the characters wear French clothing, why the inflection of the food and the buildings is all this kind of French colonial style. Those were all things w that were just a not part of my, my visual imagination up until I got it together to have a conversation with my grandmother about what her world looked like. Wow, well, and if you think our Cinderella has the sort of Western Cinderella has a wicked stepmother. Wait till you read this wicked <laughs> stepmother. <laughs> this one's really wicked. Uh, so when you did all of this research as you were developing these ideas, and there's a fun part at the back of the book where you get to see how the kind of the characters evolved, uh, how they're originally drawn and how they evolved. But you came up with this idea for the first story, the first Cinderella story, um, of these three dresses that are contained in a walnut. This, of course, is a fairy, sta fairy st story. So, they, of course, they all those big voluminous dresses will fit in a walnut, um, and they they pop out at really uh, useful times. Tell us about those three and why you settled on those three. Yeah. So I. So in The Magic Fish, the, it's sort of a story within a story structure. And so there are three fairy tales that are told from the perspective of 
three different characters that come from three different generations. Um, a part of the project that I kind of put myself on for making the magic fish was I wanted to kind of um, be really radically empathetic in a way that I hadn't really thought of before. I wanted to figure out what the visual imagination of each of these characters from distinct generations looked like. Um, and so I, I explained a little bit about the, um, the Vietnamese Cinderella already. Um, but for the, the first fairy tale, I was, um, it's told through the perspective of Thien, the main character. And uh, he's a 13-year-old boy who was living in the 90s, who grew up in the United States. And so I decided to kind of figure out like why, like what kind of iconography would he have grown up with. And so that version of um, Cinderella is sort of this uh, mishmash of different kinds of sort of like European styles. And so it's this flattened sort of disney style, but the thing that interested me about the ways that Disney conveyed the princesses um, was that I had never asked why princess dresses look the way that they do, and it was through this telling of the first fairy tale that I got to understand that clothing, that material, comes from context that we don't always appreciate, and that the silhouette for the princess dresses actually kind of come out of this um, post-war world where uh, where um, the austerity measures on the use of fabrics could finally be lifted and fashion designers could go all out and use tons and tons of fabric again. Um, in the 1940s, um, during the Second World War, fabric was apportioned to the war effort. And so the cut of all of the clothing was very conservative and very practical. And then, as soon as the war was over, the, the dresses, the gowns that you see in uh, like Audrey Hepburn movies, those enormous Givenchy gowns, those were, th those were kind of a celebration of the fact that we had access to luxury again. And so that kind of, like coming out of, of taking the silhouette for granted, like princess dresses always look like this, to kind of understanding that all of these things that we take for granted have a story in and of themselves is kind of the reason why I chose to explore visually that portion of the story that way. Wow, again, I mean, who knew? I, I certainly did not. And this, what this book does is it works on these multiple levels. There are all these layers. So when I read it with my nine, eight and nine-year-old kids, they'll probably get what I got the first time around. Uh, and the second time around, I got a whole lot more, and I'm looking forward to the, to the third uh, <laughs> with, with the kids. Uh, but the central story is this story of Tian. And there's a, f a figure in that story, Father Niles, who, I, I forget exactly what the word is, um, the, wha the faith counseling. Father Niles does faith counseling. And his first counseling is, well, don't talk to your parents about it. And <laughs> maybe that was a thing in the 1990s. But you know, the advice, to don't talk to your parents about who you are. Um, that was quite striking to me. I'm sure there's been faith counseling of all kinds that's been uh, uh, not very wise. Uh, it, it, but in this case, what is, is Father Niles, does he draw from somebody in your life or were there, was there ever faith counseling in your life? Yeah, that was a moment in the book that was lifted out of my life. Um, but I sort of remixed it a little bit. So it happens to, to the end in the story when he's in middle school. This was something that happened to me in high school. Um, I was uh, like, I was a pretty astute kid, and I uh, was very over involved, and I was a pretty good student. And so I had a pretty easy time in high school for the most part. But when I was 16, I decided that I really wanted a GSA in my high school. <laughs> um, and I went to Catholic school, so it was a challenge. Um, uh, and I, I was. Gay Students Alliance. Oh, yeah, a gay straight alliance is. Straight alliance. Yeah. Was a th it, it was like the, the, the late 2000s, and so this was a thing that was still um, kind of, that was the language of the time. And I, in hindsight, I don't think that I recognized the political quagmire that I was about to walk into because I assumed, you know, all of these people around me, like these adults who are responsible for stewarding me into adulthood myself, like, th they're there to take care of me. And then I kind of brought up this idea, and I talked to some, some teachers, and they were like, oh, we, we, who were ordinarily very supportive, and they suddenly couldn't help me do this. And I was like, oh, okay, so there's something else here. Maybe I should talk to the administration, because if the teachers can't help me, there must be a reason. Um, and at some Catholic schools, uh, in order to work there, you have to sign some kind of morality clause. 
Um, so the teachers were not allowed to be involved in anything supportive of LGBTQ students in, a, in an overt way. Um, and I didn't know that at the time. And so I had a conversation with actually the president of the school. And I remember this very specifically because in 2007, there were, in my area, there was a like a spike in teen suicides that were related to homophobic bullying. And it was something that I was kind of tertiarily aware of at the time, but it wasn't at the front of my mind because I had other things going on. I was, you know, 16 and I was, you know, I was really focused on like, how do we establish this organization? Why can't you give me what I want? Um, and the language that he used to describe, um, and I would learn later that he was also a gay man and he had a partner and he had children, um, but he told me that for Catholic families, if you were to come out to your parents, oftentimes they report feeling as though their child has died, which was something that I don't think that I fully absorbed at the time. Um, and in, in retrospect, I'm actually quite you know, protective of my teenage self as an adult now. I'm like, oh, this was a really inappropriate thing to tell to a teenager at that specific moment in time. And so I, I kind of used that moment um, in the book as a way to sort of process where this administrator was coming from in the context of my family's faith and in the context of that moment and what he must have been thinking. I wonder if this resonates with anybody in the audience. I'm, I'm remembering in the 1980s starting a gay-straight alliance at Johns Hopkins SICE and how incredibly shocking that was to people at SICE. And this is Washington, D.C. This is not r rural Minnesota or or other, you know, other parts of the country where it might have been seemed really radical. Um, anyway, it was it was brave to do, and it was very brave to write this book. And so I want to know what projects are on the drawing board now. Uh, well, uh, so the Magic Fish started off as just a, I, it's my debut graphic novel, and so when I pitched it. I sort of saw it as an opportunity to just tell all of my favorite fairy tales, and so that's why there are so many different stories in it, because I really didn't know whether or not I would get an opportunity to do this again. Um, so uh, yeah, and it, it started as sort of a fun art project for me, because the narrative came a little bit later, the pictures came first, um, which is ironic, because I, I'm a sort of, it turns out, graphic novelist who needs to have a story written before I draw anything, because that's just not how my brain is organized. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, the magic fish wound up being a little heavier than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Apologies in advance for that. Um, and so uh, the next book that I'm making is just going to be, a, it's a, a teenage rom-com. It's called Angelica and the Bear Prince, and it's based on a different fairy tale called East of the Sun and West of the Moon. It's a, a, an early iteration of Beauty and the Beast, except it's set in a uh, local puppet theater. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of what I'm working on next, and I've done some smaller projects for for Marvel and DC in between. And you've gone from being kind of a part-time writer to full-time, is that yes. right? Yes. Yeah. This is my this is my full-time job. Fantastic. And maybe Jay is helping is su is supporting <laughs> you. Uh, it's hard to be a full-time writer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure that other folks have a chance to ask questions. Uh, I have loved our conversation, and I could monopolize it all evening, but uh, I wonder if there are any, any questions out there. We have mics on Here both we sides go. of the uh, room. Phone call. I Thank will you. say, oh. before we start, um, I've been talking to the American Library Association while we talk. Um, Ted and Sean, we both signed you up to talk on behalf of libraries, so <laughs> just so you know. Yay. Um, thank you. Wow, this is really good. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Vietnam Society. Um, just to kind of bring it back to Vietnam a little bit, mm -hmm. you've been in Vietnam, um, and book ban. You know, when you when you say when you say that term, it should be more prevalent there than here, right? Your book. Uh, well, my book has been banned. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> feel so some sympathy. But so here we are. <laughs> but uh, what I want to get to is um, the language. <laughs> but come back to me a little 
Okay. All right. <laughs> but banned books. I got it. I got it. Banned books. Banned books, but LGBTQ. Ha. Huh. Like, yeah. Vietnam is a Confucian society. You know, it should, by all definition, be much more conservative than just about any other place. Yet, from what I've seen, somehow um, it's able to kind of either skip over or, you know, it's, it's not that bad. In some yeah. respect, it is bad. Some other respect, there's, there seems to be a certain degree of freedom there, Absolutely. even more so than political freedom. How is that? Maybe we, we can both take a stab at this. Um, I, I, my experience was that uh, when I was getting ready to go as ambassador, I was a little nervous. Am I going to get agreement? This is a very conservative society that had run social evils campaigns against homosexuality and so on. And here I was going to be showing up um, kind of like a Benetton ad, or at least that's what the president said. My husband's black, my children are brown, Mexican-American, I'm, I'm a white guy. Um, and I wondered how would we be received. And uh, a couple things happened. One, the Supreme Court passed Obergefell, which made our marriage, we'd been married in Canada, but this made our marriage valid in all 50 states. And right after that, Ruth Bader Ginsburg came to Vietnam. And so, of course, we organized press conference so she could explain what had happened, and we ha she explained what had happened to the Supreme Court of Vietnam. But the other thing she did was she renewed our wedding vows in our living room with our children in our arms. And this kind of went viral in, uh, when this happened, because there's RBG, and there are these very cute children, and there's you know these two dads. Um, and this was a little surprising, but it, the, picture, the pictures went everywhere. And so from that moment on, I cannot tell you how many kids came up to us at restaurants, when we were traveling, whatever. They would say, you know, I, I told my dad that the American ambassador is gay. And he said, no way, that's not possible, I can't believe it. But then I showed him this picture. And he said, oh my god, it may be true. And, and, for, you know, and what we were able to do was show that you can be yourself, have a career, you can even have a family if you're lucky. And a lot of kids came out to their parents at, or came out at work or, or you know, made a decision to, to come out. And I kept thinking, well, there's going to be some blowback, and there never was. And I think partly it's because there, certainly there's Catholicism, but it's not that pervasive. There's uh, it's a Confucian society. There's a certain tolerance that's built into Buddhism, and we weren't making trouble for the Communist Party. I thought that was the biggest thing, because you know if if you're you know your environmental activist or something, they might slam you into the into jail. But if you're if you're gay, well, you're not really hurting anybody. You're certainly not hurting the Communist Party. So we were welcomed everywhere. There was no problem, and you know, I had great friendships with all the, the top leaders, and uh, they didn't care that we were gay. It didn't matter at all. And I really felt that everywhere we went in the country. That didn't matter. I was the ambassador. I thought, well, I might be labeled as the gay ambassador, but no, I was the ambassador who spoke Vietnamese. People were much more interested in that. Um. <laughs> So anecdotally speaking, I was really terrified to come out to my parents because I didn't know what their social values were around these specific things. And I knew that they were very Catholic and I knew that my, you know, all of my friends had Catholic parents too because we all went to the same schools. Um, and they were overtly homophobic, so I just assumed that my parents were going to be homophobic, but my parents are sort of interesting. So my dad um, spent most of his youth as a prize fighter and so he has like a very proto-masculine way of moving through the world. Um, and that's actually how he met my mother because my mother lived in Yetjang. And so, uh, and after the war, like it was a very poor area when she was growing up and there was a lot of domestic violence. And so she decided to kind of take it upon herself to be like, oh, well, the practical solution to this problem is I'm going to learn how to defend myself. And she took lessons and my father was really impressed with the way that she could crack a man's jaw with her foot. So. They got married. Um, 
so uh, and and they 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 you know they absconded the country together. They're Vietnamese boat people. I was born in a refugee camp, and so the way that they think about the world is very practical. They don't really have a lot of uh, they don't have strong allegiances to institutions. And so if the Catholic Church says something, if the government says something, that's not something that they're super inclined to listen to in general because they've seen governments kind of come and go before in their lifetimes. Um, and so they lacked the language to really express their support for me, but I was really terrified to come out to them. And when it did happen, uh, it was by accident and they were completely supportive. And then we had conversations later on um, uh, when I was an adult and my dad was like, well, I didn't know how to talk about it, but I knew that you were going to be bullied probably, and so that's why I taught you and your little brother how to fight <laughs> also. <laughs> so I think f from what I've heard um, around a lot like other Vietnamese American immigrants and uh, around a lot other, other like queer LGBTQ Vietnamese people, there are a lot of different perspectives. Um, some people do still have, of course, very conservative social values. Um, but for the most part, they're always kind of concerned with the practical problem that's in front of them. And if you don't present a problem, they don't really see why it's <laughs> affecting their life. And that's kind of the tack that my parents took. It didn't adversely affect their lives. My life was needed to be better than theirs. And so as long as I was happy, they were happy. And that was kind of the way that they explained it to me. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for writing this book. It's my favorite gra graphic novel. Um, and I'm also an artist, so I'm curious about your choice to use fairy tale, use stories, use allegory to, as a vehicle to tell personal stories, you know, but as you said, not necessarily having to put your own trauma front and center, uh, especially er you know, early on in your career. Thank you. Um. So, I mean, fairy tales have always been really important to me because like the characters in the book, um, I learned English alongside my parents and we would go to the library and we would pick out books and I would always pick out the books with the prettiest pictures and those always wound up being fairy tales and so we read them to each other when I was growing up and my parents are very proficient in English now um, and we speak a hybrid language at home. Um, and so it was, it's just something that's always been a part of my life and I think that when I was a kid, um, my parents didn't have a lot of context for all of the things that were going on around me in the US. Like, they didn't know what any of the holidays were. Um, I remember teachers explaining to them like what Valentine's Day was and why I had to put together all these cards for my classmates. Like, <laughs> there were just all these little rituals that I think as an American, I completely take for granted, but like to someone who is foreign, completely bewildering. Um, and so fairy tales were so like, they were fine to me because it required the same leap in imagination as imagining what a Valentine's Day is, you know? <laughs> and so it has, it's always been sort of this very integral part of my life where these just happen to be the stories to which I gravitated. And I now have sort of developed a sentiment around them because that's how I came to understand my parents better and spend time with them and go on this journey with them a little bit and kind of making sure that we, we felt safe in the US. And so, um, and so using fairy tales, um, kind of is this wonderful starting point because it's sort of this common language that we all have, but the ways in which it can be iterated upon are so contextual and so nuanced and so infinite. And so many different cultures can have echoes of the same story. And I love that. I love that a fairy tale is, uh, well, I mean, it's a lot like Vietnamese people in general because Vietnam as a culture has survived by adapting. That's why we use French loan words and that's why we have um, but me, that's why there's pate in our, our sandwiches. We, we adapt. And so fairy tales being stories that kind of change clothes depending on the culture in which you find them, like that's something that I still really gravitate towards. And so fairy tales have always been kind of very important to me for that reason. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the practicalities of how you actually lay out, uh, write, and draw the book. Uh, do you work digitally at all? I imagine the colors are digital, but. Sure, okay, so um, so the magic fish was something that I had actually assumed that 
would be, it, it was a book that I assumed would be reaching people who weren't familiar with graphic novels. And so there are things that I did in The Magic Fish that are very intentional that you don't find in a lot of other comic books. Like I don't use action lines in The Magic Fish. Um, I don't use kind of like uh, comic book orthography. That grammar is something that I sort of want to ease readers into. And so the sequences of images are very, um, uh, they're not rote precisely, but they're very pared down on a technical level. Um, so everything is very simplified. If you've never read a graphic novel before, this is a very accessible access point. Um, so I, it turns out that most comic book creators work totally differently from each other. Um, I had never written a long form comic book before, and so I, I reached out to a lot of other creators to see how they put together their scripts. Um, and a lot of them really kindly sent me their examples. Um, and since I'd you know, grown up reading comic books, I knew what they looked like, and so I had some idea about how to put them together. Um, because I consider myself to be an artist first, uh, I assumed that I would start the story visually, but that I was very wrong. I needed to write the story before I started to put the images down. Um, and some artists can work visually first. Some of them thumbnail and plan things out visually, but I had to write it like a prose document first. Um, so I wrote it first, and then I thumbnailed it. I laid out the, the panels to make sure that the, the pages kind of flowed exactly where I wanted them to flow, to make sure that the reader's eye was sort of drawn from one place to another in a pleasing way that wasn't confusing. Um, yeah, so I, I did all of the, I tried to do everything in a way that was sort of prescribed, and then I eventually gave that up and just did it my own way. Um, but yeah, no, the process was very much, I had to write it, and then I drew it, and then I inked over it, and then I scanned it and sent it in. I drew most of the book traditionally um, on very accessible paper. <laughs> like, I, I think most of my materials came from Office Max. Like, I would just draw it on, like, on cardstock paper. I used um, fine liner, you know, pens that I would get from an art store, but that was the only fancy material that I used. And I think it says in the book the first 160 or so pages are done traditionally, and then the rest of it was done digitally because the scanning and the formatting and the erasing and the cleaning up, all of that starts to add up after a while, and I wanted to make my editors happy with me, and so I switched to, I learned how to work digitally, and it was very awkward at first, but I'm, I'm very comfortable with it now. Good evening, thank you very much. So I wanna talk about a very important year. Your book came out October 13, 2020. I was in New York City, March of 2020, and I remember when everything was silent and the whole world was under lockdown. And I was working at the hospital as a emergency staff at New York City Health and Hospital, and I remember how in October, as I started reading your book, it really resonated with me. When you were talking and you asked those questions, I almost cried wow. because it was moments where I had to take a moment and say, I'm in the audience, there's people looking at me, and this guy next to me is taking pictures, and I don't want any <laughs> teardrops <laughs> coming down my face. <laughs> so when I started reading your book, October of 2020, people were slowly coming out of their houses and going about. It came to a realization after reading your book and the whole year 2020, I told myself I'm not happy because I went in the life that my parents told me what to do. S culture told me what to do. It was good that the world was silent in 2020 because it was perfect timing for your book to come out. So I resonated with that because as I was reading those graphic novels and those pictures because you can, I'm an artist myself and it took me a while to be comfortable and say that I am a creative person right now. But that's not about me, that's, uh, we're gonna talk about this. It resonated with me in a way that I think will help a lot of people and will help many younger generation. And I have to mention my cousin name because I will get emotional if I don't mention this, but I gave her the book when my Iraqi Kurdish parents, on a, with the help of their mom's sisters, she went, they took her and forced her to go to conversion therapy. 
And the last time I saw her was, I gave her this book and I said, this is what you need, you need courage. Because it's conversations like this that we need to have. It's people like you that needs to talk about things like that. Because if you, one of my favorite quotes that I'll, I'll read it to you because it's not my quote, it's been, it's one of the things that has to be said, it's never said quite enough. And it's one of the things that always has to be said. If you add up the women, if you add up the people of color, if you add up the Jews, the homosexuals, the LGBTQ, the trans people, they're being targeted daily, unfortunately by the right-wing media in the United States. And throughout the world, it's much worse. But if we see ourselves as a majority, we are the majority right now. And we need to have conversations like this because it's through voices like you that actually you make a deep connection to someone like me living in New York, to someone like my cousin, all the way across on the other side of the world, which, fun fact, your book is actually banned in many Middle Eastern countries, <laughs> unfortunately. So I just, it's not really a question, it's a comment on your bravery and being authentic. And thank you for that. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'll take one more question so we can s sign books. Oh, two more. We'll do two more. <laughs> Hi, uh, Zhao An. <laughs> That's like the little Vietnamese I know. Um, I really liked how you talked about the inspiration you pulled from fairy tales um, and tying it with how practical Vietnamese people are because what I think is funny is that fairy tales come from like Germanic languages or like Danish culture where they're very blunt, they're very straightforward and somehow they're constructing like these other universes and these worlds to get lost in, obviously for the practical reason to learn a lesson. Um, but what really struck me was that I just picked up this coffee right now and when I picked it up, I was like, something is very familiar about the art style um, because I think if you're an, a children of immigrants or if you're an Asian child or uh, you grew up in an Asian household, no matter where you, like, no matter if you're an anime nerd right now or not, graphic novels were a part of your life at some point and I just really wanna understand like, why this book feels like every graphic novel or every Asian inspired cartoon that I've ever consumed ever in my life and being very, like how did you get it to be so familiar? Um, and like what was your artistic inspiration coming from? Um, okay, so that's very astute. So I have a, a, a nerdy answer in two different directions. First of all, the outfit that I'm wearing right now, the mood board for it was Mamaru from Sailor Moon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you picked up on that immediately. <laughs> so, uh, so that's there's a little bit of that in there. Um, uh, the other thing is that when when I was in in college, I um, I didn't have any designs to become an artist because I'm the eldest kid in an immigrant family, and so I tried to be as practical as possible. So I, I studied iconography instead. I wanted to know art history because I like learning where images kind of come from. And the the era that I was most interested in was kind of the Gilded Age. And so all of my illustrations look a little bit like woodcut illustrations from that era when the printing press was starting to become a little bit more accessible to publishers. And so if it feels like an old fairy tale, it's because I was looking at a lot of old fairy tale illustrations. And if it feels a little bit like your like Naoko Takeuchi is somewhere in there, it's because she was a huge part of my life. Let's do one more question. Hate to cut off a beautiful conversation, but we want people to have time to sign books. <laughs> so my question I think was already answered, but I just wanted to echo what so many people have said. It's a fantastic book. Your style is just uh, beautiful, and thank you for all the work that you put into it.
Thank you, Trung, and thank you, Ted. I'll just say, I'm, I'm David Quick. I work here at the library, and uh, uh, at Band Books Week, an event that's with beautiful partners like the Vietnam Society and Malapia, and to hear such a beautiful conversation with between Trung and Ted that's just about just so much. I, it fills my heart. This is why we do this. So I'm so glad that you all came. Um, uh, you're going to sign some books up and sign and sell books, Trung. Thank you for that. Um, keep an eye on everything else we're doing this week. Um, you know, Saturday is uh, with uh, Lupita Reads, so we're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. Sunday we're doing punk. We're it's just the I'm lucky guy. I get to be here at the library and get to just bring all these people together. And but again, thank you, Charm, for this. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. 